your neighbor, it's time. Tell your neighbor, it's time to worship. It's time for freedom. It's time for healing. It's time for miracles. It's time for deliverance. It's time to break off oppression and desolation. Amen. Well, you know, Chuck was talking to me a few weeks back and he said, one of the things that is to characterize this move of the spirit that we're in is deliverance. This is a time for oppression and depression and oppression and uh, all, any, any of, of those attacks from this time for them to be over. It's time to drive the enemy back. Now, uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. But before I do, I want you to know of some resources that you can make use of if you are under desolation, if you're under the oppression of the enemy, and you don't know how to get free. One is a book, and really, if, if anybody calls the office for a deliverance appointment, this is the first step. It's called Set Yourself Free, and it takes you through a series of encounters with God, transactions with God, and many people get thoroughly set free doing this. So the book is Set Yourself Free. You can get it on our web store. You can buy it here. Then if you've done that and you still need some help, we have wonderful deliverance ministers on staff. So call the office, call Janice, and just say, I need a deliverance appointment. They will set you up with one, and you will get free. Because this is a time to be set free. And so this morning what I want to do, and really uh, I've, I've changed the title since what I gave Brian uh, to put in the, the uh, emailer, uh, but what Keith knows, this is exactly what Keith has been saying. And so this morning I want to talk about breaking desolation, the power of true worship. Because three weeks ago Chuck talked about thorns and about demons. Now, Paul had a thorn in his flesh. It was a situation or a person that was sent by Satan to torment him, and he prayed for it to be removed, and God said, uh-uh, not yet. God temporarily allowed the thorn so that Paul could gain a better appreciation of grace. And see, God often allows thorns and uses thorns to hedge us in and protect, prevent us from getting off the path. Demons are also sent by Satan. Demons are evil spiritual beings assigned by Satan to afflict destruction and loss. Demons always desire to do you harm. And while thorns can sometimes be tolerated, demons must always be resisted and driven out. That's what Jesus did every time he met a demon. Somebody said Jesus never met a demon that he liked. Now, you'll never appreciate the importance of driving out demons and driving back demons until you understand the absolute goodness of God. James 1.17 describes God's goodness this way. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. There's no eclipse to his goodness. There is no variation in God's goodness. God is always good all the time. Tell your neighbor, God is good. God's goodness is expressed in everything that he does. You know, when God created the human race, he didn't stick Adam and Eve down in the middle of a desolate wilderness. That was not his will for us. God is good, and he does not want his children to live in desolation. God did not put them in a ghetto. You know, a ghetto is just a different kind of a desolation. It is a place where life cannot flourish. And that was not God's plan for the human race. God does not want his children to live in poverty and oppression. When God created us, he put us in an earthly paradise. 
It was a place of beauty and full provision. It was a place overflowing with life. And see, God's plan is always for abundant life. Anytime you are not experiencing a flow of abundant, overflowing life, it means Satan and his demons are at work. Now see, J Jesus said Satan's goal is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now back in Isaiah 14, 17, there's an interesting phrase that describes Satan as the one who makes the world a desert. And I think that's a very interesting phrase. So God wanted a garden. Satan's goal is a desert. Satan wants to bring desolation to everything God created. Now what's desolation? Dictionary definition, desolation is a desert, a ruin, a place made barren or laid waste, an uninhabited place, lonely, abandoned, empty, and hopeless. So be, to be desolate is to become barren, to be drained of life, to have no hope and no purpose. And that is what Satan sends his demons out to do. They come to bring desolation. They want to bring desolation to your land, to your territory. They, he, he, Satan wants to bring desolation in your life. Now, a few weeks ago, Chuck outlined five things that Satan uses to bring desolation. And to overcome him, we must win the battle in each of these five areas. Now, this is an over, uh, uh, overhead. I actually made it for Chuck. He hasn't used it yet, so act like you're surprised when he, when he finally does. <laughs> but this is how Satan takes a territory. First of all, there are five pillars that he establishes. First pillar is false religion. Second is immorality. Third is broken covenants. Fourth is innocent bloodshed. Fifth is God robbing. And see, when Satan can establish those five pillars in a territory, then he is able to establish and form a throne of iniquity. Now, what's a throne of iniquity? I like to call it a portal into hell. Because, see, those five things, once they're established, those give Satan authority in the territory to accomplish his purposes. Demons begin to operate very freely. And the result is that darkness penetrates the earth. The land is overtaken by the curse. Deuteronomy 28 says the curse involves things like violence and oppression and poverty and famine and disease, increasing natural disasters. And the result is the territory is polluted and made desolate. Now the first pillar that Satan establishes to exert his influence is false religion. That means worshiping anything else but the true God. And Satan uses false religion to bring a territory into desolation. See, where God is worshiped, it's like there's a portal that opens up into the heavens. And the flow of God's blessing begins to flow down into the earth realm and the land flourishes. You know, the Bible says uh, what's happening spiritually doesn't just affect us. It actually affects the very land that we live in. Deuteronomy 28, if you obey the Lord, he will grant you abundant prosperity. The crops of your land will be blessed, the calves of your herds, the lambs of your flocks. The Lord will open the heavens to send rain on your land in its season to bless all the work of your hands. He says, where God has worshipped, the land itself is blessed. But where Satan establishes false religion, the territory is cut off from God's blessing. And the land becomes desolate. Isaiah 24. It says the earth dries up and withers. The world languishes and wastes away. The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants for they transgressed laws, violated statues, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore a curse devours the earth. 
Deuteronomy 28 describes what it's like when the land is under a curse. It says the sky over your head will be bronze, the ground beneath you is iron, the rain will turn to dust and powder, it will come down from the skies until you're destroyed. See, that's the land becoming a desert. So the Bible says when the inhabitants of a land turn from the true God, Satan's demons are freed to operate in the land, and a fertile land can literally become a desert. Now I want to tell you something. Sometimes we read things like that in the Bible and just, you know, just we don't pay much attention to them. And the Bible says things like that all the time. But I want to tell you something, when the Bible says that, it's, it's not just words to fill up space on a page. I mean, you look down through history, what these verses describe has taken place literally over and over and over again. Let's look at some case studies. One is North Africa. You know, North Africa was a stronghold of early Christianity. Augustine, the famous theologian, lived in what was now Algeria. His mother was from one of the Berber tribes of North Africa. Now at that time, North Africa was called the Roman granary, and it was also called the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. Roman Africa was known for lush fields, amber waves of grain. But in the 7th century, the armies of Islam marched across North Africa. The church had gotten cold and dead, had no spiritual strength left. The Christians were forcibly converted to Islam. And in one century, North Africa became Islamic territory. But as the inhabitants of the land turned from worshiping the God of the Bible, the land itself changed. One writer said after the Islamic conquest, the Roman Empire's breadbasket in North Africa, which once contained 600 cities, became a desert. And all across North Africa, you find once flourishing Roman cities lying in ruins surrounded by the Sahara Desert. That's called desolation. See, your worship affects your land. It makes a difference who you worship and how you worship. Let's look at another case. I want you to see this is real. I mean, this is something that affects any land you're in in the world. In the Caribbean, there's an island called the Island of Hispaniola. Now, this island is occupied by two countries. On the east, on the west is Haiti, and on the east is the Dominican Republic. Now the Dominican Republic is a beautiful tropical paradise. Many of the best resorts in the Caribbean are in the Dominican Republic. It's a very prosperous country. It has a healthy economy. It's the second largest economy in the Caribbean. But Haiti is a different story. Even though Haiti shares the same island, Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. It has no topsoil. The ground is barren and unproductive. Only 2% of the land has tree cover. Uh, dry dust swirls at the slightest breeze. Most of the people live in dire poverty. It's called the hell hole of the, of the Caribbean. Now, how do we explain the contrast? Haiti, what we need to see is Haiti was not always mired in poverty. As a matter of fact, Haiti was once a lush tropical paradise. It used to be called the jewel of the Caribbean. It was the richest colony in the entire world. It had topsoil 10 feet thick and its enormously fertile soil produced a great abundance of crops. It was so rich, it's estimated that in the 1750s, Haiti produced as much as 50% of the gross national product of France. Import and export profits of Haiti exceeded those of the entire United States. So what happened to Haiti? 
On August the 14th, 1791, a group of voodoo priests led by a former slave named Bukman made a pact with the devil at a place called Bua Kayaman. A priestess possessed by an evil spirit sacrificed a black pig in a voodoo ritual. They all drank the pig's blood and asked the demons for help in liberating Haiti from the French. And the Haitian independence movement was birthed. Haitians attribute the birth of their nation to that voodoo ceremony. And as a result, Haiti is the only country in the world that has dedicated its lands to demons. Every year on August the 14th, that demonic sacrifice is repeated and affirmed. Haiti's political leaders openly acknowledge the demonic foundation of their nation. Demonic spirits have been consulted for political decisions and have shaped the country's history. And voodoo has become such a part of Haiti's culture that even nominal Christians sacrifice to demons in voodoo ceremonies. And see, God says false worship brings desolation. And see, some people would try to tell you it doesn't matter which God people worship. I want to tell you, people suffer when false religion brings desolation to their land. See, through false religion, Satan defiles a land and fills it with darkness. And within that darkness, his demons are free to release sickness and poverty and violence and death. But the reverse is also true. Where God is worshipped, that portal opens into the heavens and the atmosphere of the territory changes. The blessing of God is released. The Bible promises that also. Malachi 3 says, when we walk in obedience to God, God promises, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. And the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit. And all of the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land. Let's look at some more case studies. The greatest revival in modern history was begun by Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf in a little village called Hernhut, Germany, back in the early 1700s. The spirit fell in 1727, and Hernhut soon became an apostolic setter sending revival throughout the world. To keep the fire on the altar, they made Hernhut a place of continual prayer, praise, and worship. And for over a hundred years, they had continual prayer, praise, and worship going on at Hernhut 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, how many think that might have had an effect on the territory? You know, even today, the effects of that are evident. Right after East Germany opened up, we took a team in to go to Hernhut. Hernhut is located at the far eastern side of what had been East Germany. And East, East Germany was still recovering from years of communist oppression. Driving through East Germany, we saw dirt, decay, and graffiti everywhere. There was a sense of hopelessness that pervaded every town we drove through. Because the East German government was one of the most oppressive regimes in modern history, and it had a profound effect on the people. East Germany was a depressing place. The whole land was in desolation. But then we got into Hernhut. And down at the end of the road, we got to Hernhut, and in Hernhut, the whole t in the whole town, there was nothing dirty, there was nothing broken down. We didn't see any graffiti anywhere in the town. It was a place of prosperity and well-being. I mean, we got out of the car after all that time of driving through East Germany. We got out of the car, looked around, took a deep breath, and we said, oh, God is here. You could sense the presence of God. I talked with one of the leaders there and said, what was it like to live as a Christian in communist East Germany? I hear Christians were persecuted terribly. And he said, oh, most places they were, but they didn't bother us too much here. 
See, East Germany was in desolation, but in her hut, desolation was broken. A hundred years of continual worship had a dramatic effect on the land. Let's look at another example. It's a little town called Almolonga, Guatemala. Some, how many have been to Almolonga? I know some of you. Yeah, a good number here. One writer described the village of Almolonga, Guatemala as a drought plague pit of poverty, demon worship, and alcoholism. See, the Spanish conquistadors had built a church in the village, but the natives refused to give up the, the pagan idol they called Maximan. And so the Spaniards took that pagan Maximon idol and put it in the church and changed its name to St. Simon so the people could continue worshiping it. So while the village was nominally Catholic, witchcraft, superstition, and the worship of the demon god Maximon remained the norm. How many know that's called false religion? Now, Amalonga was the basket case of the region. The fields surrounding the town were barren and unproductive. Crops wilted if they grew at all. Drunkenness, petty crime, and poverty ruled the town. Prostitution was widespread. Wife beating was epidemic. By the 1980s, the village of Amalonga had four jails and yet on Saturday nights, they often had to rent buses to haul the overflow to jails in surrounding cities. But then some Christians started to pray. And revival came to Amalanga. As a matter of fact, one of the most impressive revivals in recent history, it brought in a massive harvest of souls. One report said by the end of the 1980s, Almolonga was perhaps the most thoroughly Christian place on the planet. Estimates range between 80 to 95 percent of the city got thoroughly saved. The idols to Maximon were burned. Churches sprung up everywhere. By 1989, every one of the town's 36 bars had closed. And the last of the jails was padlocked because there was just no crime. Large worship celebrations were held on the city's main street with 20,000 newly saved believers joyfully singing together and dancing and waving banners. Businesses began to spring up with corny names like the Garden of Eden Cafe or the Hallelujah Laundry. That's good. That's good. And then something amazing happened. As the people turned to God, the land itself changed. Underground springs broke open and drenched the park soil. The fields began to flourish, producing up to three crops a year. And the gourmet vegetables they produced are huge. I mean, they have carrots the size of your forearm. Almolonga is now known as the miracle city and the garden spot of Guatemala. Produce from Almolonga is exported all over Guatemala and even to the U.S. And everyone is prosperous. Literacy shot up. There were churches on every corner and banks every few doors down. Some farmers paid cash for new Mercedes-Benz trucks to haul their produce to market. That's called breaking desolation. And that is not unusual. Peter Wagner has done a study back through history and he said every, every time you find a city or a group of people who made a substantial shift to the things of God, who, who, who embraced Christianity, he said every time that happened in a group situation like this, with one, within one generation, you have a dramatic increase in standard of living. Peter calls it redemption 
and lift. You get a people redeemed, they start walking in blessing. And see, that's the goodness of God. He wants us to live in a land that flourishes, a land that reflects his glory. He wants to change the spiritual atmosphere of your territory. He wants to free Satan's captives and bring them into his light. And yet there's something more important to God than changing the territory you live in. See, God isn't just concerned about the territory around you. His main concern is for the territory in you. God wants to fill you with abundant, overflowing life. He wants those rivers of living water to begin bubbling up and flowing out wherever you are. He wants you to live in a land that flourishes, but more than that, he wants you to flourish. He wants you to overflow with life and joy and love. He wants to change the spiritual atmosphere of the territory, but even more than that, he wants to create an atmosphere of faith in you. And see, the problem is just as Satan wants to make your territory a desert, he wants to make your life a desert also. He wants to put the desolation in you. He wants to make your life a waste, ruined, desert, barren place, lonely, abandoned, empty, and hopeless. And the same things that give demons access to a territory also give them access to you. Satan's number one strategy to bring people into desolation is called false religion. False religion is any religion that doesn't offer full and free forgiveness through Jesus. It's any religion that denies the power of the Holy Spirit. It includes every form of idolatry, superstition, secret societies, witchcraft, voodoo, and the occult. It also includes any kind of religion that has been overtaken by a religious spirit. See, any religion can be a false religion if there is a religious spirit behind it. Many Christians know the word and they're even filled with the spirit, but they have been overtaken by a spirit of religion. That was what happened to Saul of Tarsus. I mean, Saul was not a bad guy. He's the kind of guy you would have wanted your sister to marry. I mean, Saul knew the true God. He lived a righteous life. He was trained in the word. But because he had such a Pharisaic religious spirit, he could not even recognize the Messiah when he came. Paul later said to let your life be controlled by a religious spirit is really the worst kind of sin. 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul wrote, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. You know, for years I read that and I thought, huh. He said he was the very worst kind of sinner there is. You wonder, what did he do? Was he a murderer? Was he a rapist? Was he a thief? No. He lived a righteous life. And yet he was the worst kind of sinner. Because he was religious. He was a Pharisee. He had a religious spirit. And see, something most churches will never tell you this secret. God is not religious. God does, being religious does not please God. See, a religious spirit produces pride, legalism, hypocrisy, self-righteousness, and judgmentalism. And then it makes you think that all of that is somehow pleasing to God. And God hates it. You know, Jesus did not mind fellowshipping with thieves and drunkards and prostitutes. But he had his harshest condemnation for those who allowed their lives to be ruled by religious spirits. Let me tell you something. If your religion is a matter of knowing all the right doctrines, Keeping all the right rules, doing all the right rituals, 
and condemning everybody who is not as right as you are, I have some sad news for you. You have a religious spirit. If your religion is not a living, joy-filled love relationship with Jesus, it is a false religion. And it will keep you in barrenness and desolation all your life. But if you have been in any kind of false religion, I have good news for you. You can repent. You can turn from that false religion. You can renounce it and confess it as a sin. You can break the power of that religious spirit and be free. You can ask Holy Spirit to fill you with his joy, his love, his power, his freedom. You know, Hebrews 6 talks about repenting of dead works. That's something else most Christians don't understand. They think repentance means c confessing all the bad things you've done. But see, we don't need to just repent of doing things that are bad. We need to repent of some things that we thought were good. We need to repent of dead religion that is not from God. Now, if you have allowed your life to be dominated by a religious spirit, the fact is you've opened a door. There are religious spirits at work in your life to rob you of God's life and joy and power and to make your life a desolation. See, Satan wants to make your life as dry and as desolate as the Sahara Desert. I can testify to that. I went, by the time I got out of seminary, I was a Pharisee. I was as religious as you had gotten. My head was stuffed full of doctrines and facts and theology, and I just knew that I knew more than anybody else in the world. And I knew I was right, and most other people were wrong. And, I mean, I would get in theological discussions and debates, and I could, you know, I knew I was right. And I, I could shut down just about anybody on any subject. And then I would go home at night. And I would say, oh God, oh God, oh God. I am so dry. I'm going to die. Lord, I can't take it anymore. It's got to be something more to knowing you than what I'm seeing. And see, that's what false religion will do for you. You can be proud and you can be puffed up, but on the inside, you're dying. That's called desolation. The good news is, you can break that desolation. Just as God broke desolation in that village of Almalanga so the city could flourish and prosper, God wants to break desolation in you. If you feel dry and empty on the inside, God wants you to know he can set you free. It's time to break the power of false religion and let his living water flow. God says let desolation be broken today. Now, before we go into any kind of ministry time, I want Pam and Linda to come up. Because Pam and Linda. Now, Linda was with me in that wonderful period of religious spirit. And she got set free, but she's also a great deliverance minister. And so in just a minute, I want her to pray a deliverance prayer for deliverance from religious spirit. Let's all stand up. And then, having seen the garden, I know that Pam has anointing and authority to break desolation and release life to flourish. So I want Linda to lead in a prayer of deliverance from religious spirits. And then I want Pam to release the anointing to flourish, to break desolation. 
Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we confess that we've been religious. We confess that we have taken pride in what we know and what we can do. We've exalted ourselves one above the other. Um, we've put each other down if we didn't feel like someone else was performing as well as we were. Lord, we, we stand before you guilty as charged. Uh, there's no excuse and there's nothing we can say for it. But Lord, you said you, if we confess our sin, that you're faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us. So Father, today we confess and you, you confess personally whatever the Lord's putting on your heart between you and him. We confess the way we have agreed with, cooperated with, been in full cooperation with a spirit of religion. And right now, since it's been exposed, then we renounce it, we repent of it, we turn away from it. Now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us and not hold this sin against our charge. Don't charge this sin to us. Wipe it out. Wipe it out. Now, I say to every spirit of religion that has prompted these things, these thoughts, these emotions, mindsets, perspectives, that has prompted pride, that has prompted uh, self-exaltation, that has prompted performance, that has um, prompted condemnation of others, judging others because, uh, by a legalistic standard, setting up a standard that God never set up, and requiring people to measure up to it to gain approval with the church and even to make them feel like they have to gain approval with God because of the way they performed. There is nothing we can do to gain approval from God. We've already got it. He loved us before we knew him. He loved us when we were his enemies. He loved us when we were sinners. He loves us now. Now I say to that lying spirit of religion, get out. Get out of this church. Get out of our lives. Get out of our minds. Get out of our mindsets. Get out. Take everything with you as you go. Take all your rules. Take all your pride. Take all your bondage. And we are going to step into the freedom of what it means to be set free by the Son of Righteousness, whom the Son sets free is free indeed, and we will not live under the constraints of a spirit of religion any longer. Amen. Amen. Now that we've dealt with that, uh, I want you to stop and think a minute about uh, what God did in creation and how he put his hands to shape and design everything. And it was all very good. Now, obviously it's not as good as it was in the beginning because we've been dealing with the curse for a long time that has worked its way into the earth and into our lives. But now that that is broken by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, we need to follow the model that God has given us in creation and create with our own hands spiritually that which is meant to prosper. So uh, if you're a gardener, you know that when you get out there, you can't just look at it and expect it to do its thing. You have to get down in the dirt. And I have a hard time sometimes working with gloves on. I like to feel the dirt. And then I have to go home and soak my hands for hours. So you want to, you want to cooperate with Holy Spirit and put your hands on those places of desolation in your own life. Robert just got through teaching on the doctrine of laying on of hands. You're going to lay some hands on yourself 
and break the, the power of desolation because Jesus told his disciples and us that we would do greater works. So we have the power and the authority given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ to break desolation in our lives, in our land, in our homes, in our families. So Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you have given us authority over those places of desolation and that we can touch them and speak to them and say, prosper. That desolation no longer has authority, no longer has a place in our lives, in our homes, in our gardens, in our families, in our children and grandchildren. But we speak to those places of desolation and say, spring up, O oh well, and bring forth life in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Now lift up your hands. Lord, right now, by the authority of Jesus, we release those springs of living water to bubble up inside each one of us that all desolation is broken. Lord, there are there even now are streams flowing in the desert and we declare desolation is broken. Now just receive, just receive, just receive. Now tell your neighbor, desolation is broken. Mm. Keith, do you have anything else? Give, uh, give somebody near you a hug and pray a blessing over them. Say, you will flourish this week and you're dismissed.